this morning we're beginning a new series of sermons talking about different questions that are being asked and the title of the series is what does it mean and today we're going to be looking at what does it mean to trust Jesus you know we, we trust him as our personal Lord and Savior and we trust him as the one who is in charge of everything in our life and you know sometimes things go well don't they we can point back to things and times in our life where everything has worked like clockwork and it has been absolutely amazing to watch God work. And then there's been those times where everything looked like it just fell apart. And you know what? This is one of those times. In Paul and Silas's life, all of a sudden it looks like everything has gone wrong. Because in the passage that we're going to be dealing with, the, the, the area of Acts that we're dealing with, what has happened is Paul's on a missionary journey. That's God's call. That's what he's supposed to be doing. Paul is preaching the gospel in Europe for the first time. And, 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 and it's, it, it's been amazing that he's got his convert there. But as he's going around in the city of Philippi, all of a sudden, he sees a slave girl... And this slave girl, as, as the scripture tells us, is uh, inhabited by a spirit. A, a, a demon is living within her. In the Greek it would say she has the spirit of the python. Which you know what the spirit of the python is? It's the ability to be a fortune teller. Now isn't it interesting... In the, in the culture we live in, fortune-telling is, is considered very, very important and high. And most people would never understand that fortune-telling is a source from Satan. And so here, Paul and Silas recognize that what's going on. Matter of fact, she recognizes them. She's out there exposing who they are. These are men from the Most High God. They're the ones who are going to show you a way of salvation. And in the midst of all this confusion about her, Paul and Silas pray, and the spirit that is inhabiting her is moved on. And she's healed. Well, you know what? The people that owned her weren't very happy because their economy was wrecked. And when their economy was wrecked, they carried Paul and Silas before the magistrate. The magistrate threw them in jail because they healed a person. Now listen, they're on God's mission, doing God's thing at God's time, and they're thrown in jail. And while they're thrown in jail... What happens? They're in stocks. It's at midnight. What are they doing? What would you be doing if you were wrongly accused, wrongly put in jail, and in a miserable situation? I know what I would most likely be doing, complaining. God, why me? Why am I here? I was out working. I was out doing. I was doing everything you told me to do. I was bringing people to Jesus. Why am I in this situation? Listen, some of you are crying out right now, why am I in this situation? Why am I in this problem? And I want you to know, God's not abandoned you. At midnight, in the darkness, in the dungeon. What's Paul doing? What's Silas doing? They're not complaining about the Roman government. Because you see, Paul was a Roman citizen. And to be beaten by somebody as a Roman citizen is an offense that is punishable by death. Now think about that. They have beaten Paul. They've put him in stocks. He could have yelled out, I'm a Roman citizen. You don't have that right. But he didn't. And there at midnight, what's happening? Is he complaining about the government? Is he complaining about God not showing up? Is he complaining about... No, we find Paul and Silas in the middle of the midnight time praising God 
for who he is. Now we look at it and go, who he is? What do you mean who he is? He hasn't shown up yet. God's been all over it. In the middle of this, an earthquake comes. Who's in charge of earthquakes? Natural slippages of, of tectonic plates? No, God's in control of that. And when the earthquake happens, all the stocks pop open. All the doors of the jail break open. And you know what? All of a sudden, every prisoner there, it says, is free. But it's also interesting that not one prisoner left. You know why? I think they were all so enthralled with the message that Paul and Silas were talking about, the message of hope that they were sharing. They wanted to hear about this hope. They wanted to hear what was going on. The Roman guard looks up, sees everything that's happened, the earthquake, the damage to the jail, the fact that everybody's cells are open. What does he do? He does what any respectable guard would do. He pulls out his sword and he starts to kill himself. He's going to commit suicide. In the middle of that, Paul cries out and says, We're all still here. Now, can you imagine? If the jail cells in Hong Kong popped open right now, do you think everybody would stay inside? They did there. Acts 16, verse 30 and 31. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you and your household, you will be saved, you and your household. It's interesting. Five words in Greek and English. What must I do to be saved? Believe. Look at that. Believe in the Lord Jesus. It's just that simple. You see, what we need to understand is when we believe in Jesus, it's not about us, it's about what He's done for us. And when we think about trust in Jesus, I, I want us to understand, in order for me to place my trust in Jesus, first it means that I acknowledge that I even need a Savior. You see, that's something unique. In our world today, we have people all over the world that say, I don't need a Savior. I'm a good person. I don't need a Savior. I'm financially secure. I don't need a Savior. I'm fit. I'm healthy. I'm good. We talk about everything about us like we really did something. Let me, let me ask you something. Do you need anyone else? No, I'm a person. I can take care of myself. You know, I, I was told that the Chinese culture is a very community-oriented culture and they're in that individualism. You know what I found out? There he is. Yeah. You're also, you're community-oriented just like the U.S. is community-oriented. You, you kind of show some things a little more than, than, than others. But the reality is, when it comes down to it, everybody's looking out for themselves. And everybody's thinking about themselves. And everybody's wanting the best for themselves. I want the best for me. I want the best for my family. I want the best for my kids. I want my kids to accelerate over your kids so that they can have a better job, so that they can have income, so that they can take care of me when I'm old and I'm not stuck in one of these elderly homes. I'm in charge of my future. I'm in charge of everything. I rely on me. Well, you know what? If you're relying on you and I'm relying on me, we've got the security of the Titanic on our side. And if you don't know what the Titanic is, it was the best built ship in its day. And on its maiden voyage, it sank. And most, many of the people on board drowned. 
you're a titanic waiting to happen you need Jesus I need Jesus when this man comes out and he says what do I have to do to be saved what was he you know some people some people say well you know he was he was worried about the earthquake he was worried about how do I get saved from the earthquake no he wasn't the earthquake was over have you ever lived through an earthquake I have it's kind of an interesting thing that the earth all of a sudden moves under your feet we were we were looking at a farm one day near our house and literally on that farm there had been an earthquake the night before and the ground level was 10 feet different than it was the day before and there was a wall that it created our house had been damaged in that earthquake and you know what it lasted just seconds so he wasn't worried about the earthquake he'd already lived through earthquakes before he knew what that was all about was he worried about whether or not he would face punishment because of the escape of the prisoners? No, because they're all accounted for. They're all there. Was he worried over the fact that Paul may say, I'm a Roman? He may have been a little worried about that, but I don't think that was it. So what was it? I think Paul understood, I mean, that this Philippian jailer understood something. He had been hearing the message of Paul. He had been hearing the message of Silas. He had probably heard the testimony of the slave girl healed he had probably heard a little bit of what her prophecy, her fortune-telling ability about these guys. These guys are the guys that are bringing salvation, the way of salvation for us. And he looks and he says, what must I do to be saved? He understood that he personally was a lawbreaker. He understood that he, in his sinful practices, was exactly what Jeremiah had said in Jeremiah 17 9 when it says the heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick who can understand it you know and in our in our world we we continuously talk about well, I'm not I'm not wicked I'm a good person I've sat knee to knee with mass murderers and they're all good people. Their mothers love them. And in their own mind, they've got a qualifying factor that makes them acceptable and okay. But here's an interesting twist. If we go to James chapter 4, verse 17, it says, Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, it's sin. Think about that. You know, so many times we think about all the negative, all the bad, all the other things. But if you know the right thing to do, and you don't do it, that's sinful. We do that every day, don't we? We know it's right to speak up on behalf of someone we know is being belittled or badgered or bullied or shamed or lied about. Oh, I don't want to get involved. Your non-involvement just created a sin in your life. Wow. And you know, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. You're held accountable. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us are helpless to save ourselves. Let me give you an experiment to do. If you think you are so powerful that you can change the world, change the behavior of your boss this week.
Change the behavior of your spouse this week. Change the behavior of your children this week. Not just in their action, but in their heart. You can't. I can't. God can. You and I are sinners. You and I are lawbreakers. You and I fail to do what's right. We need a Savior. So what do we do? There are only two categories of people in the world. You know, we, we tend to break them up in multiple... Educated, uneducated, poverty, wealthy, um, Asian, non-Asian, white, black. We, we, we go all over the place with all these distinctions. You know, there's only, as I've said before, there's only one race of people in the world, and that's called the human race. And, and there is no other race. There are differences, yes, but there are differences even among every single group of people. But here, there are only two kinds of people, saved and lost. So, to trust Jesus means that I recognize Jesus as the only God who can save. Some people sometimes ask, is there more than one God? In the minds of people, yes. In reality, no. Because people will take carvings of wood that will rot one day, no matter how much you treasure it. They'll take a rock and carve a rock, and, and, and no matter how much you treasure it, one day that rock will be ground and, and, and burned away. And we call those gods. And some people have gods that they don't even recognize as God. And, and you know what? You'll notice when we're talking about God, we capitalize it because there's only one. That's Him. If you're talking about any of the other gods, it's a little g. So if you're going to talk about the Yahweh God who is able to save, then you put a capital. If you want to talk about any other God which really don't exist except in the minds and hearts of people, then you can put little g. Think about this. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Paul was in an area preaching. He and Silas in that area of Philippi, they had multiple, multiple temples to multiple gods. Thousands of gods existed in their day, in their minds and in their hearts. Just like thousands of gods exist today in the minds and hearts of people here. I was carrying on a conversation with someone two weeks ago, and they were talking about in their family alone, they worship over 10,000 gods. And I'm thinking, how? How do you know which one to appease at which time to make sure that everything's going to be good and everything's going to be okay? The reality is those 10,000 gods don't exist. There is one God, and he came as the incarnate being, Jesus Christ. There is only one. Listen to what Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 39 says. Know therefore today, and take it to heart, that the Lord, He is God, in heaven above, and on earth below, there is no other. Now, now somebody will say, but, you know, the, the Muslims, what about the God they serve, the Islam, and, 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 you know, they talk about Allah. Is that the same God as, as our God? No, it's not. Not, not even close. In fact, if you theologically look at Allah and you theologically look at God that we worship, they're exact opposites. What, what about what the Mormon church preaches and, and, and teaches? No, that's not the same God. What about Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, no, not the same God. But I thought they're Christians. No, they're not. 
You're a Christian because you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Neither Mormons nor Jehovah's Witnesses believe that. Can a Catholic? Are they worshiping the same God? Depends on what Catholic you're talking to. Because some Catholics worship Mary and some worship Jesus Christ. You know what? We look in our world and we say, what about it all? God says there was no other God before him and he says there is no other God after him. He stands alone. So you and I need to understand that when I'm trusting in Jesus, I'm placing my trust in him accepting the fact that he and he alone is God and that there is no other. The third thing I want us to see <clears throat> to trust in Jesus means that I believe on him. <clears throat> now, I know some people in the English world will go, on? Shouldn't that say in? No, it shouldn't. Because there's a whole different mindset here. On means he is our source of dependence. On means I am participating with him. I am trusting in Him. I am placing my life in Him. I am moving beyond that reliance on myself and I am placing everything I believe on Him. So, when we look at it, we're not believing in a creed. We're not believing in a statement of faith. We're not believing in baptism. We're not believing in any rite or any ritual. We're believing in Jesus. Notice what they say. Remember, he says, What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved. Not believe and be baptized and you'll be saved. Not believe and do good works and you'll be saved. Not be, be a good person and, and, and show that you can complete all these steps and, and bring your resume to God to prove that you're somebody and, and then you can be saved. No, he says all you and I have to do is believe and be saved. What a powerful, powerful statement. It is so simple that it creates so much problem because our mentality says you don't get anything for nothing. Well, you know what? We've told people before, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to give up anything. You don't have to do anything to accept Jesus Christ. But when you believe on Jesus, you are saying, Jesus, here is my life. It is being given to you. I understand that you died for me. You bought me with a price. You paid for me with your blood. And I am offering my life as a living, holy sacrifice to you. Holy meaning set apart for your purpose. So when we believe on Jesus, we believe on what he did. He died on a cross for us. We believe what the gospel says about Jesus. The gospel in a nutshell is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 6. It says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas then to the twelve after that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time most of who remain until now but a few have fallen asleep listen to that the life the death the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mark 16 tells us that he has ascended into heaven. He's received up by God. Jesus on the cross yells out, It is finished. Prior to the cross, he was praying to God when he said, I've glorified you on the earth, Lord. 
and I've done my work. I've accomplished everything you've asked me to do. He's ready for the cross. In Acts chapter 1, verse 11, it says, They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come again in just the same way as you have watched him go up into heaven. I want us to understand, when I say I trust in Jesus, I believe he lived a perfect life, sinless. I believe that he fulfilled every need that was necessary to become the blood sacrifice for me. I believe that he did that for you too. And I believe he died on the cross. And after dying on the cross, he was buried and he rose again to life after three days. And then 40 days later, ascended into heaven and sat down at the hand, right hand of God, having finished his work. I believe he's able to save. And you know what? I don't believe that God is just able to save me from a future eternity separated him from him for hell. Matter of fact, God didn't, God didn't come to save me from hell. He came to save me from sin. Sin is what destroys. Sin is what destroys me from everything. Now, because of my... If I were belligerent and decided not to accept his gift, then I would experience hell because of my own choice. But God came to save me from my sin. Not just so that I could have eternity with him in heaven, but so that I could begin to experience eternity right now here on earth so to say that I trust in Jesus means that I declare that he is my Lord my Lord and when I make Jesus Lord I understand he's the beginning and the ending of everything he is the almighty God he is the one that should be in charge of my life. The scripture tells us that God made Christ both Lord and the Christ. Made Jesus both Lord and the Christ. He has bought us. And the scripture tells us that one day, every knee, one day the president of China will bow before Jesus Christ and say, I recognize very clearly that you are the Lord. It doesn't matter whether he believes now or not. Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, all the Caesars, all the leaders of the world currently and in the past and in the future will bow before Jesus Christ and say, You are Lord. And you know what? says every knee will bow every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord now to us that really doesn't say a lot because that word Lord to us doesn't really mean a lot but in the day that Paul was speaking these words Caesar was Lord. And to proclaim anyone else as Lord would mean you would put your life on the line because you could be sold into slavery. Your household goods could be sold off. Your family could be sold off. Or you could be brought before the circus and destroyed by wild animals as entertainment for somebody else. Or you could be strapped to a pole and tarred and be the evening lamp for Nero during his parties. 
when you called someone other than the Caesar Lord, you put your life in jeopardy. These people understood that it was major. Paul would say in Romans chapter 14, verse 8 and 9, For if I live, or if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. You and I need to understand Jesus needs to be our personal Lord. There are so many times people will say, uh, Pastor, I'm, I'm afraid at my workplace to let people know I'm a Christian. I'm afraid at my family to let people know I'm a Christian. I'm afraid, and I don't know what the circumstances and the situation are in your household. I know that in my own personal household, there were people that, that disassociated with me when I became a preacher. Because it was not seen as something that was valuable or valid. I had people that literally told me I was never to be in their house, never to be at their funeral, because I followed Jesus. You know what? That may happen with you too. But I can guarantee you this. God has multiplied back to me relationships that are amazing. I've got, I've got grandmothers and grandfathers and parents and grandparents all, from all over the world. You know, it's amazing. When Jesus is your Lord, everywhere there's a Christian, there's family. It's amazing. Trust Him. Trust Him for your salvation. And trust Him in the middle of your circumstances right now. Because don't get stuck in this idea that Jesus is big enough to save me in the future, but not big enough to save me right now. He is. Will you go through some tough times? Possibly. Very likely. Remember, Paul and Silas were doing God's work in God's time at God's place when they were beaten and thrown to jail. But if they wouldn't have been in that situation and praising God in the middle of it for who He was, then they wouldn't have had the opportunity to win the Philippian jailer and his household. And I have a feeling that there were a lot of those prisoners that went home changed people. Don't rob God of an opportunity because of your complaining about your circumstance. Trust Him. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your presence and your power, your authority. Thank you for the salvation you bring. Not only for a secure future, but a secure present. And Lord, help us understand that even in the middle of the issues that we live in, you are Lord. There's not one thing that has happened in the last 18 months that has not come without your awareness and Lord you are in the process of working all things to bring you honor and glory Lord help us not miss that may we trust you enough to look for what you're doing guide us now that those that are in this audience or those that are listening 
do not know you, that they would give their life to you and cry out, Lord, save me. For those of us who are Christians, Lord, strengthen our faith. Help us in our unbelief. In Jesus' name, amen.